a lot of uh, the incumbents were very uh, so uh, have to uh, have Dr. Ryan Feldman from the PharmD uh, in the uh, Department of Emergency Medicine at Frater Hospital. Also works with us as a spy a specialist at the uh, Wisconsin Poison Center. Uh, is studying for his ADAT. Just recently got board certified this year in the American. Tell me what it is. Before. And importantly, uh, he really is uh, going all out for us this morning because he's sick and was up all night with fever uh, and uh, went to an end of care this morning and I'm hoping that he's going to last through this whole stuff because he knows more about this than any of us do. Um, so we'll see how he, uh, right honestly, if we're not uh, able to get through the whole thing, we'll take it back another time. But uh, really appreciate your valiant effort in being with us today uh, and teaching us more about extracorporeal removal.
optimization for ion trapping of acids such as salicylate, or you can do extracorporeal toxin removal. So that's what we're going to focus on is this ECTR and the different modalities that are available. So to define this, extracorporeal elimination is really any method uh, used to remove a substance outside the body with the principles of convection. And convection we define as the movement of a solute from one compartment to another through the processes of both advection and diffusion. So this is where we get into all the fun definitions. So I think everybody remembers what diffusion is. You take a solute and put it in a solvent, give yourself a semi-permeable membrane, it will diffuse across the membrane following the concentration gradient. Advection is just a fancy word for solute drag. So that uh, solute is dissolved in the solvent, and wherever that solvent goes, so will the solute. So I think a uh, tea bag is a good analogy. If you take a bag of tea and put it in a cup of water, all the chemicals and the delicious flavors will diffuse into the tea, and uh, you'll get a nice cup of tea. And then if you take that bag out and you squeeze it, all the water that gets squeezed out of the bag through the tea bag membrane into the cup of tea is advected into the cup of tea. So the solute drag and drag along with the solvent, that's advection, and the natural uh, thermodynamic property of small particles to diffuse across the big concentration rate is to move across the concentration rate. So we'll come back to those in a little bit. I just want to establish the main forces that govern extra component toxicity. So the different modalities that we have available for ECTR, uh, there's peritoneal dialysis, we have chemoperfusion, plasmapheresis, intermittent hemodialysis, and continuous renal replacement therapy. And with IHD and CRRT, as we call them, um, they get defined as different things depending on whether or not they're using advection or uh, diffusion or both. Um, but we're not going to get too much into the area of details with that, but you might see some abbreviations referencing that later. Uh, so just a quick overview of all the different modalities. Peritoneal dialysis, this is a diffusion-dependent ECTR. So you put some dialysate within the peritoneal space, toxins would diffuse into that dialysate, which is the solute acceptor, and then you drain that dialysate off and the toxins go with it. <coughs> This requires a long dwell time in the peritoneal space in order to get a lot of, this, uh, of these toxins out. And unfortunately, the driving force, which is the diffusive equilibrium, is, uh, quickly reaches an equilibrium with the amount of toxins that are in the body. So uh, you quickly lose your driving force for diffusion in this scenario. Uh, and it's not acutely effective at removing toxins from the body. Uh, hemoperfusion is another modality that is used. And this one actually, I know they said everything uses convection and advection, but this one actually uses adsorption, which is the process where a polymer or some other substance directly binds and removes a toxin from the blood. Um, so our favorite adsorber in toxicology is activated charcoal that adsorbs drugs in the gut and prevents them from being uh, absorbed. Um, so in a hemoperfusion circuit, you run blood through an absorption column, which is typically a charcoal filter, although there are other uh, substances that they use, some that are a little more lipophilic. Uh, and then drug or toxin is bound into that charcoal filter, and the blood is reintroduced into the body. There are a lot of problems with this, unfortunately, because we cannot decide what gets picked up into that absorption column. So uh, there tend to be a lot of significant derangements, such as electrolyte and calcium derangements, the most thrombocytopenia and coagulopathies when this is used. And also the filters have a pretty short shelf life, so a lot of hospitals don't want to hold on to them because it's expensive. Uh, so this is one that you will rarely ever see used. However, uh, it is recommended in certain guidelines for removal of specific drugs. Then we have plasmapheresis. So this is an invective ECT. What you do is take the blood, spin it out, take the plasma and all the drug that's dissolved within the plasma, and dump that into a waste bucket, give the blood back, and whatever replacement fluid you want to get back with it. Uh, unfortunately, this requires a lot of resource, including plasma and albumin. Uh, and there are 
sometimes more efficient ways to actually get rid of the right from this. So then we get out to our primary modalities, which would be intermittent hemodialysis, which is both a diffusive and an effective process. Um, and this intermittent hemodialysis has the highest rates of blood flow that we can use in any of these processes. And thus, uh, because I can push more blood through the system at one time, I can clear more blood of toxin at one time. And it is the fastest toxin removing um, modality that we have available. So in dialysis, as you see, we can put the blood through a dialysis filter. We have dialysate running counter current to the blood. It sucks all the toxins up, goes into its waste bucket, and the blood is goes back into uh, the human body without going through a charcoal filter or anything like that. Uh, it's dependent on the solutes moving across the membrane of the dialysis filter. So the dialysis filters also play a large role in how much drug can be removed. Uh, you have high efficiency or high flux dialysis filters, which we'll talk about. They're big, large pores that let uh, more molecules through. Um, and then you can also uh, actually push some fluid out through this, uh, setting a transmembrane pressure. We have a negative pressure within the dialysate, positive pressure in the blood compartment, and following the pressure gradient, the blood will move across the membrane, or fluid will move across the membrane. So you can actually use that infection within intermittent hemodialysis as well. And then, because you move things so fastly in intermittent hemodialysis, you have big fluid shifts. And those big fluid shifts can lead to hypotension. And if you have a patient who's in severe vasoplegic shock, uh, you probably don't want to cause a lot of hypotension. So if they can't tolerate these big fluid shifts all at once, we just do it over a very extended period of time, which would be continuous renal replacement therapy. Now, CRRT is the exact same concept. It's just done you know, until uh, an endpoint. So there's no you know, few hour session. You continue it you see the endpoint you want, which would be removal of toxin or acid base balance. Uh, and with CRRT, these are those definitions I talked about. We have things called uh, continuous mean or venous hemodia filtration. So you see CBV HDF. That means you're doing both diffusion and infection. So you're running dialysate countercurrent to uh, the blood that's being pushed out or the food being pushed out. And then we have CVVH, or sometimes called uh, CVVHF, continuous venovenous hemofiltration. And this is only advection, so there's no dialysis here. Uh, and this is also known as slow continuous ultrafiltration, or SCUF, which you'll sometimes see reported in the literature. Okay, so now that the definitions are out of the way, Let's talk about what drugs we're actually able to use these modalities on. Uh, it's not necessarily all drugs. And for example, there's a work group called the Extracorporeal Treatment in Poisoning Work Group, or Extra Work Group. Um, and they come up, it's a group of nephrologists, toxicologists, pharmacists, uh, a lot of different specialties getting together to talk about what drugs. Uh, or what overdoses you should pursue using ECTRN. <coughs> and here's a list of their recommendations. So they've only listed uh, about 14 drugs that they have official guidelines written for, uh, which is certainly not all inclusive. Uh, but in their guidelines, you can see that intermittent hemodialysis is the first line recommendation for every single drug that they do say you should use ECTR for because it's the fastest at toxin removal um, and will quickly de uh, enhance the elimination. After that, you have some, uh, I guess we can't see this here, but this says CRRT and hemoperfusion. So uh, a couple of drugs they recommend either CRRT or hemoperfusion. A second line of high HD is now available and the exchange transfusion plasma paresis for certain uh, other drugs can be on AIDS alone. But as you can see down here, there's two drugs, digoxin and tricyclic antidepressants, for which no ECTR is recommended by this work group. So it's not that every single drug can be removed by these modalities. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about why. So I want to go back to that uh, initial talk about adfection and diffusion. So to understand what drugs can be removed, we need to understand the properties that govern both adfection and diffusion. So, jump a little bit more into that. So, diffusion, 
the process where a substrate moves from a high concentration to a low concentration uh, is the primary modality for movement of small molecules in ECTR. So little molecules love to move around quickly, and they will quickly diffuse across the membrane. Diffusion is dependent on the concentration gradient of the drug, which we can set up in a dialysate machine based on the flow rate of the blood and the countercurrent flow of the dialysate. And then it's dependent on another function that we call diffusivity. More of an abstract function, but diffusivity is inversely related to the molecular weight of the drug, and that is a physical property that we cannot change. Uh, but it's also inversely related to the membrane thickness of a dialyzer. So you can affect the diffusivity of a compound based on the membrane thickness of the dialyzer you're using and the countercurrent flow rates that you're using within those systems. So we can express the diffusive flux or the amount of drug that's able to diffuse as an equation. Some people like math, some people like pictures, so I'll try to be both. Uh, so diffusivity times, so the largest of the molecule, times the uh, concentration gradient set up for the molecule divided by the thickness of the membrane, so a thicker membrane is harder to diffuse through, times the temperature and the surface area. So obviously temperature, the more energy you put into a system, the faster the molecules are moving, the quicker they can get across the membrane, and the more surface area you have, the more opportunity there is for a drug to move across the membrane. You can see how ensuring we have good countercurrent flow, a high surface area membrane, uh, and you know, low thickness membrane could all affect the diffusivity of the drug, which we can optimize. But what we can't change is the molecular weight. So what about infection? So this is the sum of a substrate that is uh, carrying the solid thread. So it's a function of hydrostatic pressure, which uh, in a dialysis circuit is called the tree. So it's how much negative pressure you have on the dialysate side versus how much positive pressure you have on the blood side. Um, and it's also a function of the concentration of drug within that plasma that's being pushed across the gradient and the, and the amount of that drug that's able to get through the membrane. So the amount of drug that's able to move through is called the seeding coefficient. And that's also known as one minus the reflection coefficient. So it really makes sense. It's how much drug am I pushing through this membrane? And how much solvent am I pushing through? How much drug is dissolved in that solvent? And how much that drug is reflecting on the membrane as I push it through? So the advection flux, we call it hydrostatic pressure times the plasma concentration times the CV coefficient. So if we want to talk about the total sum of drug removal, well, it's our advective flux plus our diffusive flux. No, sorry, just to go back. So the advective flux is one of the most important fluxes for large molecules. Big molecules, unlike little molecules, don't move as quickly across a gradient. So while they may diffuse, an advective flux is better at removing the large molecules. Think about like a big walrus is not going to move around a lot, but a little mouse is going to be jumping all over the place. So the big walruses don't want to move, and you kind of have to drag them across the membrane, but the mouse is just going to jump over by itself. So, the amount of drug we can remove is the amount of food removed times the concentration times the amount that's able to get through there times the diffusivity of the compound, its concentration rate, temperature, and surface area. So why am I giving you all these math equations? Because the drugs that cannot be removed by extracorporeal treatment all have one of these things significantly affected. So, we tend to have a rule of thumb for drugs that are not good candidates for removal by ECTR. Uh, and that's large molecules with large volumes of distribution that are highly protein bound. So, drugs with large molecular weights, greater than 5,000 Daltons. Uh, when talking about dialysis, I think that's the only time you ever re refer to compounds in Daltons, but uh, that is, appears to be the standard. Uh, so, a drug that has 5,000 Daltons is actually pretty rare to come across. Insulin, for example, is about 6,000 Daltons. So when you dialyze somebody, you don't remove all their insulin. <coughs> but most drugs these days are relatively small molecules, so you're unlikely to see a lot of them. But a large molecule, a 
would affect my diffusivity because you know that diffusivity D is inversely related to molecular weight. And it also affects my seeding coefficient, right? So, uh, because the larger my molecule, the more likely I am to reflect off the membrane. So, large molecules have decreased diffusivity and decreased seeding coefficients. So, that affects both the diffusive and invective flux. And then, drugs with high volumes of distribution. So, when we perform any of these ECTR modalities, it's all within the plasma compartment. So any drug that's sitting within the peripheral tissue uh, is not going to get dialyzed. So this is going to affect my concentration that's available to be dialyzed in the cells with infection that affects my concentration gradient. Uh, <clears throat> so we said that any drug with a volume distribution greater than one liter per kilo is a kind of distal rule of thumb. Uh, has a relatively high volume distribution and it's more likely to live within the tissues of the body than the plasma compartment. We think about the distribution of total body water is roughly 0.7 or 0.6 liters per kilo. As you can understand that anything higher than that is probably living you know, more of the peripheral tissue than in the plasma space. And on that same note, highly lipophilic drugs. So we tend to measure the lipophilicity of a drug with something called a partition coefficient, where you dissolve the drug in an octanol of a nice fat soluble substance and or on a fat soluble uh, or a lipophilic solvent, and then you have a layer of octanol and a layer of water. And you just measure the amount that moves into the octanol compared to the water. So if you have more in the octanol, you have a more lipophilic drug. And since the body is relative, has many, many lipophilic membranes in it with our phospholipid bilayers, something that's more lipophilic is much better at penetrating into the tissue. Uh, so both of those factors lead to not having a lot of drug available to be dialyzed from the plasma. So that decreases our free concentration, affecting the advective, and actually our concentration gradient in diffusion. And then the last part would be drugs that are highly protein bound. So we consider that greater than 50% protein binding to be highly protein bound. And this affects both my free drug concentration and my concentration gradient. So <clears throat> if I have, uh, let's say, 10 moles worth of drug, uh, but it's 95% protein bound, that means that I only have uh, one mole of that drug available to be dialyzed, or essentially 5% of that drug is available to be dialyzed. So you can see you quickly reach an equilibrium with your concentration gradient with only 5% of the drug. And let's say I whisk away that, that molecule and it, it's, uh, the concentration gradient is reset. Well, I have a large depot of drug to be removed from protein and can still act as free drug within the human plasma. So protein binding acts as a protein sink within the human body to continue to deliver free drug and also uh, kind of destroys our concentration gradient within uh, the dialysis. So let's take a look at some of those drugs that the X-TRIP work group recommended dialysis for and we can try to evaluate how good of a candidate they are for ECTR. So theophylline, they said, you should dialyze this. We can see it has a small molecular weight, a volume of distribution of 0.45 liters per kilogram, and it's 40% protein, protein bound at therapeutic levels. So this is a win-win-win. No matter what, this is going to be an easily dialyzed substance. Uh, as we can see, because it lives within the plasma space, it's free to be dialyzed, and it can quickly diffuse across the membrane. Uh, valproic acid, they recommend that intermittent hemodialysis for in specific scenarios. And you can see that it has a small molecular weight, a small volume of distribution, although it's 90% protein bound at therapeutic levels. However, the extra work group that recommends dialysis for this drug recommends it generally if your symptoms are severe or if your level is greater than 900, which is about nine times therapeutic. And as we'll see in a minute, protein binding can be saturated. So if you're in a toxic ingestion, you might have a vastly larger amount of free drug than is reported in your therapeutic concentration in pharmacokinetics. So even if it's highly protein bound, dialysis may still work because you could have a lot of free drug floating around. Then digoxin and tricyclic antidepressants, they say we should not dialyze these drugs. Let's see why. So digoxin's got a small volume or a small molecular weight, but 
and, and small protein binding, only 25%, but its volume and distribution is extensive. It has a large preference for the peripheral tissue with roughly 70 times the concentration of the tissue versus the plasma. So you can dialyze all you want, but you'll only be able to remove roughly 1 70th of the digoxin. And then tricyclic antidepressants, uh, you can see small molecular weight, but once again, volume distribution is quite extensive, 5 to 20 meters per kilo, depending on what the drug is you're talking about. And they range from 70 to 95 percent protein bound. So this is a strikeout in two out of three categories, making these difficult drugs to remove with ECTR. So we can apply these principles to just about any drug that we're thinking about um, in terms of uh, whether or not it'll be a good candidate for ECTR. Uh, now, do we have any strategies that we can use to enhance the removal of some of these difficult to remove compounds? Well, for large molecular weight drugs, we can use something called a high flux membrane intermittent hemodialysis. And this has uh, higher surface area, it's more porous, so that of course is going to increase my diffusivity uh, by having higher surface area, at least my diffusion flux, and it's going to decrease my reflective coefficient, which increases my semen coefficient. So more can get through the membrane. Highly lipophilic drugs, we actually don't have a great solution for dealing with those because if they're all in your tissue, well, we can't really get them out. But if you're very lipophilic and you're not dissolved within the plasma, um, we can try to remove you from the fat by using a lipophilic adsorbent in something like a hemoperfusion perfusion chain. Uh, and then finally, protein binding. So protein binding, <coughs> the main things that are affected are the free drug concentration and the concentration gradient. <coughs> So can we increase the free drug concentration of these protein-bound drugs? So let's look a little bit more at protein binding. Albumin is the workhorse of binding drugs within the body. There's other protein binders. There's alpha acid glycoprotein. There's other uh, plasma globulins. But albumin is actually uh, designed as a carrier protein. Uh, it carries a lot of small molecules in the blood and delivers them around. So heme, fatty acids, nitric oxide, it has a plethora of binding sites. Uh, and for drugs, there are two primary binding sites. These are the primary ones, the <coughs> other ways that drugs can bind to albumin. And albumin binding is actually a very interesting and complex subject. Uh, this structure of this protein will change based on what is bound to it, based on the pH, a lot of different factors. So you could have drugs that are normally highly protein bound, but in the presence of, say, uremia and all the um, all your nitrogenous compounds get down to this, and now all your drugs are released from them, uh, such as phenytoin, for example. Um, but the primary binding sites on albumin are known as sublo 1 and sublo 2, um, and they have some stereotypical <coughs> compounds that bind to it. So uh, sublo 1 binds heterocyclic anions, that's going to be here, with warfarin or heme. Um, and interesting, when heme is bound to albumin, the affinity to bind warfarin is about a hundredfold less. So if you have somebody who's in an anemia or a hemolytic anemia and they're releasing all this heme, it binds to albumin, you release all the warfarin in your body and make the patient more anticoagulated and um, more likely to be so great for warfarin. Uh, Sublo 2 binds aromatic carboxylate compounds, so carbamazepine, uh, is that right here? Ibuprofen is known as one of the stereotypical compounds to bind there. Propofol and halothane are all possibilities. Uh, so you could imagine that there's competitive binding between these uh, sites, between different compounds. And uh, it has been looked at, uh, such as using ibuprofen to competitively bind drugs like Valproate. Uh, but what happens when we increase the free drug concentration, when we increase the competitive uh, binding at the albumin site, we increase free drug concentration, and oftentimes these patients are being dialyzed because they have toxic amount of free drug concentration than it is. So while this is good and then it frees up more compound to be removed, you may also be exposing your patient to more toxicity. So if we can't attack the free drug concentration, can we attack the concentration gradient? So that we can use countercurrent flow, which we already do in pretty much every dialysate or ECTR circuit. Uh, so we 
bring blood in one way, uh, and then all everything diffuses over at the blood inlet, and uh, the dialysis outlet takes all that solute and brings it into a wastebasket there. And by moving fresh dialysis countercurrent, we reset the concentration gradient just about every time. Um, but this is not enough to remove protein bound drugs. So uh, the smart engineers who designed um, bound solute dialysis uh, thermodynamic modeling, they looked at the amount of drug that's removed normally in a protein bound solute. Um, of a protein bound solute. And they found that normally clearance is dependent on the dialysis cartridge that's used, so we know surface area, porousness of the dialysis cartridge, and the dialysate blood flow ratio. So that would mean, yeah, the diffusivity of the drug. But when you introduce a dialysate binder into the dialysate, so on the human, it is the most significant independent factor for clearance in a thermodynamic model. So, Basically what they're saying is, if you have a bunch of drug that's bound to protein, put a bunch of protein in the dialysate and you'll bind all the drug in the dialysate, you reset the concentration gradient every time, and uh, it creates a vast increase in your diffusivity funds. So, bound solute dialysis, based on those principles, they created these uh, dialysate mechanisms really to treat hepatic failure. So it was thought that uh, the disease-related pulmonary hepatic failure might be related to inability to clear protein-bound toxins, um, and they designed these circuits in order to remove things like copper or aluminum. Or uh, they created the protein sink within the dialysate, and this increases the free solute concentration gradient. So, one of the most important parts of increasing the dialysis of protein-bound drugs. <coughs> there are four modalities available at this time. Uh, that would be the molecular adsorbent recirculating system, uh, Pro, also known as MARS from Germany, uh, Prometheus, biologic DT, and then single pass albumin dialysate. So I listed the dollar signs next to all of those because MARS, Prometheus, and biologic DT all have patents on them. And are, must, you know, if you don't have them at your institution, you're not going to be able to do, do that procedure. But single pass albumin dialysate is available for any institution because it only involves adding dialysate to, or adding albumin to your dialysate. So, <coughs> molecular adsorbent recirculating system. Uh, this is a system that you dialyze the patient, so you run their blood across the dialyzing filter, and the dialysate has albumin in it. That albumin sucks up any albumin bound toxins from the blood, and then they move it through. Uh, and charcoal filter to clean the albumin off, so it's basically uh, albumoperfusion. Um, and then that absorbs any of the toxins. And then they run it through an anion anti -ex exchange resin to continue cleaning the albumin, and then they run it back across the dialysate filter to continue picking up albumin bound toxins. Mm -hmm. So just like it says, it's an adsorbent recirculating system. You use one you know, amount of albumin, and you keep recycling it over and over. Um, <coughs> Prometheus is a slightly different uh, method. So they actually use the patient's own albumin, and they have a special pore within the Prometheus that is 250,000 Daltons that allows clearance for it. So albumin is 62,000 Daltons, so you can actually take the patient's albumin out um, through a process they call FPSA, which is fractional plasma uh, adsorbent. I can't remember what the S is for. It's just remember I'm sick, so it's cool. Uh, albumin passes through here, and then the albumin goes through two adsorbers, kind of exactly like in the Mars circuit, except this time we're using the patient's own uh, albumin. And then the albumin gets recycled back into the plasma to undergo high flux hemodialysis. So this is a little bit different. It's not really adding albumin to the dialysate. It's actually taking the albumin out, cleaning it, and putting it back into the blood, uh, which is uh, a little bit how they recommended removal of highly protein-bound drugs before, which was through use of hemoperfusion. This is just uh, doing plasma for, uh, hemoperfusion. Um, but you have to have this available to you, which many people do not. Um, and is it really different than using Mars? It has been compared 
in the clearance of uremia or clearance of protein bound toxins in liver failure. Uh, and it is slightly more effective, probably about 25% more effective at removing protein bound drugs. But if it's not available to you, it, it doesn't matter. And then lastly, there's the biologic DT. This is the same as a Mars circuit, except it uses sorbent instead of LPU. So we're just using a different absorption molecule within the dialysis. Okay. So then what about single pass albumin dialysis? So this is done with a CVPH circuit, and all you do is add 4.4% albumin, into, or create a dialysis at 4.4% albumin, uh, allow it to dialyze against the plasma, it'll suck up everything it can, and then it'll go into a waste bucket. So unfortunately, you do have to continually reuse albumin because it's a one-time use or a single pass, so you can't recycle it. Uh, but this is available at all institutions because everyone has albumin and most places have CRRT. <clears throat> so, let's go back to our patient. 58-year-old female who's in severe vasoplegic shock. She's uh, had every therapy under the sun except enhanced elimination. So, lodipine or valsartan can do candidates for extra corporeal toxin removal. But if we look at their PK here, yep, they're both small, way less than 5,000 uh, dollars. Distribution, well, I have lodipine bond in distribution, 21 liters per kilogram, that's not great. Uh, however, that's a bit repeated therapeutic effects. Uh, valsartan looks pretty good, 0. 0.6 to 2 liters per kilogram. They're both extensively protein-bound at therapeutic levels. However, uh, whether or not they interact with each other, protein binding is not known. And at toxic levels, as we know, there's only really a few uh, binding sites in albumin. So if albumin is your primary protein binder, you could have very high free levels in toxic overdose. Uh, they both have relatively high log P's, so 3 and 5.8 means they like to live in fat layers more than they like to live in water layers. And neither of them are particularly randomly eliminated. So we're seeing one, two, three, four bad signs of ECTR, and for Belsartan, uh, one, two, three sign, bad signs of ECTR. So they don't seem like great candidates. So the authors of this paper decided to throw them on molecular absorbent recirculating system uh, for two consecutive sessions. And they actually measured the pre dialysis concentration of amlodipine in the blood. Measure the post dialysis concentration and measure the amount of amylodipine within the dialysis. And they found that they were able to clear approximately 25% of the amylodipine. So, amylodipine's typical half life is 30 to 50 hours, and their Mars half life was roughly 7.6 hours, which you can see here. So, the patient was able to be weaned off of their pressors, their lactic acidosis improved significantly in over three days. Uh, they were discharged from the ICU. So <clears throat> the authors concluded that Mars had a significant impact on the clearance of amlodipine from this patient. Valsartan levels were checked. Um, and actually, if you look here, there was a massive drop in the level right before they started in MERS. And um, the authors say that that's because they get intralipid right before they started Mars, uh, which would make sense because we see a lot of P of 3 amlodipine would love to sequester into the lipid. Since we're only measuring drug within the plasma compartment, that's going to cause a significant reduction there. So the patient did improve. Uh, Mars did have a slight impact, it looks like, on the half life, although it's kind of hard to tell what the patient's half life would have been anyways. And this wasn't compared to doing regular dialysis. There have been case reports of amlodipine overdose being treated with just intermittent hemodialysis. But there's further cases of Mars. So 13-year-old female with a 4.2 gram deltaizin extended release ingestion, 55-year-old uh, with 8.4 grams of deltaizin, and a 43-year-old with 14.4 grams of deltaizin, of uh, verapamil. So if we look at the PK here, deltaizin is 70 to 80 percent protein bound. It's got a volume distribution of 3 to 13 liters, so that's not ideal for removal. Verapamil is 90 percent protein bound with a volume distribution of 4 liters per kilo. Also not ideal. So the authors of this paper said, let's put them on a molecular absorbent recirculating system, because that's how we get rid of drugs that can't be dialyzed. And 
they found that, yes, uh, for diltiazem, there was a significant decline in concentration. So the elimination rate concept increased significantly in the AUC here. Uh, and the same was found for verapamil. So they concluded that Mars was an effective uh, consideration for patients who uh, overdose on diltiazem or verapamil. And then another case here. So the fifth case, uh, and as we're going through these, these are pretty much all the cases that are available in the literature that we're going to discuss right now. These are relatively new modes of dialysis, um, and they haven't been used in toxic exposures that often. So as we are reviewing case reports, we are also reviewing most of the literature surrounding using these. Um, so a 45-year-old male who presents with status epilepticus was loaded with phenytoin and then subsequently developed rhabdomyolysis, renal and hepatic failure. So his total fatty tone level was 79, roughly four times therapeutic, and his free fatty tone level was about 17.6, so quite large. The patient was put on slow, continuous ultrafiltration for eight days. So if you remember, that's the form of CRRT that is just using infection, so we're just pushing things across the membrane. Uh, and his level was 40. So the half-life of the spending toe was approximately eight days in this scenario. The patient was then put on Mars for 11.5 hours. His spending toe dropped from 32.5 down to 11, and his free uh, spending toe was decreased about fourfold. Uh, so the authors once again concluded that Mars might be an effective modality for removal of spending toe, but if we remember, spending toe doesn't follow standard kinetics. At high doses, it's actually zero at the order of kinetics, and it takes a long, long time for us to clear it because of our metabolizing enzymes are saturated. Uh, at a level of 40, it's not clear whether or not the patient kicked into first order kinetics and was able to start removing all of these, and there's no comparator with standard dialysis methods, which are recommended by uh, extra work groups. So, Mars does appear to be effective, at least nobody's. Nobody's drug level went up while they were on it. Um, but it does lack comparison with standard therapies, and it lacks comparison with other bound solute modalities like Prometheus, Biologic DT, or single pass albumin dialysate. So, could we use single pass albumin dialysate instead of Mars? Um, I know we do not have Mars available at this instead of that freighter um, or other protein. So SPAD, or single pass of dialysate, is what we would be leading with. Uh, and a group of authors <coughs> will figure that out. So they took phenytoin, carbamazole, <coughs> and proic acid uh, in different concentrations. So we see we have a toxic level of phenytoin here, 50 mg per mil. Uh, we have a slightly supertherapeutic, maybe toxic level of carbamazepine, almost 8 to 12. This, this is a big <coughs> mid per mil concoction and then a therapeutic level of alproic acid. They took this, they mixed it in with some bovine blood, and then they ran it through a dialyzer. And they gave one of the dialyzers uh, had no albumin in it, and the other one had albumin protein. Uh, and because there's differing effects of the different dialyzer membranes, so uh, they wanted to try to control for that, so they did it against two different dialyzer membranes. So they did it one was called polysulfon, the other one was called AN69. Uh, and they looked at the different clearance rates of these drugs combined with bovine blood ran against dialysate without albumin versus with albumin. Uh, they did do some good standardization to like uh, the amount of uh, uremic molecules in there uh, to make sure the albumin binding was very similar. Uh, and now if you look at the kinetics of all these drugs, we have phenytoin, carbamazepine, and BPA, all small molecules, all have very low volumes of distribution, uh, but all of them are highly, highly protein bound. So phenytoin, 90 to 95, CBZ, 70 to 80, and BPA, about 90%. So these are good prototypical molecules to evaluate whether or not this will actually be effective or not in treating patients. Uh, and as we can see, they are relatively low. So, here we have the graphs of the proic acid clearance and carbamazepine clearance, phenytoin clearance, on one of the dialyzing machines. So as you can see, uh, this, all these, this QB180 
and QD. So Q is the flow rate. So QD, this was at a dialysate rate of 4 liters, and this was at a blood flow rate of 180 milliliters. And you can see that uh, as my dialysate rate goes up, my countercurrent flow goes up, I have increased clearance, right? And if I increase my blood flow rate, and I increase my dialysate rate, I have increased clearance. Uh, actually, this is decreased clearance, but... Um, but we can see that once we add albumin into the mix, we have large increases of clearance um, compared to our standard non-albumin dialysis. So we have a large increase in clearance for valproic acid and a large increase in clearance for carbamazepine. So it seems that the addition of a dialysate binder is the largest impact on the removal of protein bound drugs, regardless of your countercurrent flow rates that you're able to set up. Uh, however, an interesting finding in this study was that the phenytoin rates actually decreased when we added in uh, albumin. So you can see here, this is the 0% albumin. We have the highest rates of drug removal uh, with the highest rates of countercurrent flow. And when you add in 2.5% albumin or 5% albumin, it caps the clearance off. So the authors postulated that it might be a membrane effect uh, in one of the dialyzers. So when we look at the other dialyzer, well, it does the exact same thing. Uh, so this doesn't make a lot of sense. There's not a good uh, explanation for it. Some of the theories the authors think is that there's a higher binding uh, strength of phenytoin to bovine albumin, which might affect things, or that possibly introducing albumin into the dialysate might have an effect on the charge of the membrane and the amount of absorption that occurs in the membrane. Uh, because if you see here, there was, a, regardless of the amount of albumin, it seemed to cut uh, clearance to a pretty standard level. So whether it was 2.5 or 5 percent, it didn't really affect the amount of clearance. It was just lower than the amount that we can get without albumin. Uh, so there's some conflicting data, even though it would make sense that phenytoin would be removed by non-soluble dialysis, or at least by single pass of the dialysis. Uh, in the animals, it does not appear to be so. However, single pass of human dialysis has been used in a few different cases. So a 10-year-old presenting after a 1,400 milligram carbon mass being extended release ingestion, trachoma, respiratory depression, and seizure, is given about two doses of charcoal and had a level of about 43 to 44 for at least 12 hours. The patient was started on 4.5% single pass LD dialysis, uh, and their carbapenazidine level 17 hours later was down to 6.4. So the half-life of this was calculated at seven hours, uh, and the estimated natural half-life of carbapenazidine is about 15. So it did appear that uh, Bad was effective in removing this drug. Um, however, this was an extended release carbamazepine ingestion, so the patient was probably continuing to absorb and they might have been clearing more during this time than we can actually calculate, uh, which is what kept the level so stable. Uh, and this was not done against the comparator once again. Uh, and there are many case reports of using standard uh, modes of clearance for treatment of carbamazepine ingestion. So a 17-year-old girl, five hours after inten intentional ingestion of 16-gram carbamazepine was put on CBBHF, so this is just uh, continuous venomous hemofiltration. This is uh, scuff. And they found that this patient had a half-life of roughly 9.7 hours. Uh, so really, not that much different than our patient uh, and who receive single pass LD hemodialysis. And there's been other cases that show that high efficiency hemodialysis is effective at removing carbamazepine, and that hemodialysis or hemoperfusion have been effective alone. So whether or not the addition of albumin does anything more than cost money is not clear because it looks like other modalities could still work. Uh, other examples of patients who receive single pass LD hemodialysis are mainly in methotrexate, um, but this, these results are conflicting too. So, methotrexate is about 50% protein bound and it's 0.4 to 0.8 liters per kilogram. It's a 
relatively okay. It just received normal dialysis. If we look at its kinetics, uh, and one case report in 2005 reported that adding albumin to the dialysate enhanced the clearance greater than CVDHD or hemodialysis alone. But another case report uh, actually found that CVVHDF or CVVH with advection and uh, removed it more so than single pass albumin dialysis did. So there's a lot of conflicting information with this single pass albumin dialysis even though it's promising. Uh, but both human and animal models, uh, animal models showing a possible decrease in clearance for some drugs, and human models without any comparators to uh, say whether it's better than traditional therapy. So, what conclusions of any can we get out of this long talk of a lot of literature and a lot of words? Uh, I think what we can draw here is that ECTR is appropriate for certain drugs that have low molecular weights, low volumes of distribution, and low protein binding. But we should remember that protein binding is evaluated under normal kinetics, and patients taking large amounts of these drugs as single ingestions likely do not reflect the same amount of protein binding, especially patients who are acidemic or have other healthcare issues going on, like chronic kidney disease, these can all affect your protein binding too. So you don't necessarily need to wag your finger at a drug just because it's highly protein bound. Uh, low volume of distribution, uh, so a drug with a very high volume of distribution is probably not a great candidate for ECTR. Um, and most drugs are low molecular weight as it is, so we probably don't have to worry about this that much. And if you're looking for resources for what drugs should be dialyzed, there's always the X trip work group that you can refer to. Uh, currently, intermittent hemodialysis is the first line treatment for most drugs. Uh, that are recommended to get extracorporeal toxin removal, and that's through the uh, national consensus of the extra work group. But bound solute dialysis, is this appropriate for anyone? Uh, it does seem to be promising for certain patients, but we have no comparators against standard therapy, and the modality that we use might actually.